Hey everyone, welcome to another version of Tony D's Media Podcast uh, with the new camera angle. I hope you're enjoying it. I hope it's not too crooked. Oh man, I can't believe I'm doing the Media Podcast again. I didn't think I would do it anymore. And I can't believe I'm doing another Media Podcast about the Mueller report. Why won't people let this go? Why? As I said in my previous podcast, there's a big problem with this. There's a huge problem because if the Democrats who may to some extent balance out Trump or stop him from doing some of the more extreme things he and the Republicans might want to do, uh, if they want to have that power, they need to be credible. This uh, Trump-Russia narrative, it wasn't credible when they pushed it, it's not credible now, and it's even less credible. Um, just talking to people online and to people at, in IRL uh, about this, it's become a religion. You know, the Mueller report is like the Bible. Everybody takes away something different from it. These things, when it, when, it, when it comes to law enforcement, if they want to get you, okay, if you're, if you're a nobody and they want to get you, they get you. If you're a somebody with lots of money, there are certain things you can buy your way out of, essentially. But we're talking about the idea that the U.S. president, the leader of our country, is beholden to the Russians. Okay, that on its surface, no one would be for. You know, whatever you believe about the Republicans, you cannot possibly believe that they'd be okay with that in any shape or form. And you cannot possibly believe that people in Washington, D.C. don't have their ear to the ground and know a lot of things that just don't become public until many years later. I think most of the people in Washington knew this from the get-go. It was a show and it was a risk. And the risk was, if we can make this work even just a little, Trump will either be hobbled or he'll be impeached, best case scenario. But either way, he's not going to crawl out from under this because He's such a lying, dishonest guy, we're going to uncover something. But therein lies the problem. You see, Donald Trump was born rich. And I think, like a lot of rich guys, he didn't really have a lot of, I don't know what you'd call it, I don't want to say confidence, because he sort of has confidence, but I think confidence from guys like him are a little bit, it, it, it's a little bit hollow because when you start with a million dollars, even if you turn it into a hundred million dollars, nobody really gives you any credit, right? I mean, Donald Trump was from a rich, rich family. <laughs> he lived in New York. He had the best schools, had tons of money. He started on the top and he just kept going higher. So very few people will give Trump any kind of credit and he's desperate for some of that. Desperate for some sort of credit. Now, because of that, he bloviates a lot about himself. Oh, I'm the greatest, I'm a winner, we just keep winning, blah, 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 blah. You know, he. there's a reason why he has all these beautiful women who he marries and gives children to. It's partly a show to show everybody, see, see, I'm not just a rich guy. I can get these beautiful women. It's all part of a show to make himself feel better. So you'd have to wonder why a guy like that would kowtow to the Russians when they couldn't possibly offer him anything worthy of that. It's just not, there's just nothing they have to offer. He has money. 
Okay, they can't give him enough money to offset the negative. He's always had money, okay? Whether you got $10 million or a billion dollars, how much is your lifestyle really different? Is your lifestyle all that different, really? I mean, when you got $10 million, you can eat in the finest restaurants pretty much every day for the rest of your life. And when you got a billion dollars, you can eat in the finest restaurants pretty much every day for the rest of your life. So what's the difference here? And you're going to tell me like the Russians bribed him. How was he ever going to collect on that bribe? Oh, when was he going to get the money? You, you're telling me he's going to, I mean, the guy's in his seventies. First, he'd have to get all the way through maybe two terms, going to be two terms. Mark me on that. So he's going to be what? 76, 74, 76, I think he'll be. How many more years does the guy have? <laughs> How much more money? His, his kids are grown, many of them. They're all making tons of money. He's got a massive empire. He's got a worldwide name, and now he's been president. His kids, they got the world by the balls. They could run for president. They can make millions of dollars. They can do both. They can do both. And the reputation of the Trumps has not been tarnished with anybody who liked them to begin with. <laughs> the people who like the Trumps still love the Trumps. Very few people have jumped off the Trump train. As uh, one pundit online said, he has a very low floor. A low floor. You're literally going to have to, he, there's almost nothing he can do to drive his fan base below, I don't know, 30, 35 percent approval. Really, he's just hovering between 35 and 40s, low 40s. And all this investigation has done is made the Democrats look like they have nothing. Nothing. Here's the thing. I grew up on the left side of politics. I was a Democrat for many years. And the reason I was for a Democrat is, uh, a Democrat is because I was always taught the Democrats are for the working man. They're open to new things. They, they embrace all peoples. And for a lot of years, that seemed to be true. They were fighting the good fight. They were fighting the good fight for working people. They were fighting the good fight for African Americans, gay people, all these groups. And they were the underdogs. They always were the underdogs fighting the good fight. This was not a good fight. It just wasn't. Okay, it just, there wasn't any evidence of it. They cheated to get the fight going with the FISA warrant, which in, in and of itself is a cheat. As a libertarian, I'm completely against the FISA court. I think it's ridiculous. I don't think there's a judge, an American judge alive, who wouldn't be happy to seal an indictment or a, or a warrant or whatever against, say, Russians or some sort of foreign agent for the sake of national security. The FISA court is a sham. It's an absolute sham. We've said it for years. Libertarians have said it for years. And uh, it was just a matter of time before it was going to be abused like this. And think of what precedent this sets if this is let to keep continuing. This means that at any time, a sitting president can use the FISA court to wiretap his opponents who may be taking over or coming into the White House to search through all their emails, to to, to basically continually investigate them until they find something to derail their campaign. That's what this is becoming. And if that becomes the precedent, now all you have to do is imagine the Republicans have that power from now until the sun cools. Okay? 
So that's why you can't have this power. That's why the Democrats have to step back from the brink and say, we messed up. He's innocent of the charges of Russia collusion. We're going to concentrate on other things that we disagree with and rebuild the party from there. Almost every single candidate running for office for the president on the Democratic side talks about Donald Trump like he is Boris of Boris and Natasha, like, like the Soviet Union is alive and well and Donald Trump is just a KGB stooge looking to destroy America. I mean, it's insane. That kind of talk will come back to haunt them because they're not credible when they talk that way. There's a couple that don't. I, I think Tul Tulsi Gabbard is a good candidate. I'd consider seriously voting for her. I probably don't agree with much of her economics, but certainly on the foreign policy front, she seems to have her ducks in a row for the most part. And I find her credible because she was willing to work with Donald Trump when he first got into office, unlike anybody else in the Democratic Party who seemed to just be intent on ruining his presidency from day one. Can you imagine what the reaction would have been had the same thing happened to Barack Obama on his first day in office? If Republicans had been determined to ruin his presidency so badly, they were constantly invested for three years investigating Barack Obama. Can you imagine the outrage that would have happened? You have to hold people to the same standard. They are not holding Trump to the same standard. They don't like him. I get it. He's an unlikable guy. He's a dick. <laughs> we all know this. But just because you're a dick doesn't mean you deserve to go to jail or lose your job. It doesn't mean you did anything illegal. Donald Trump, in this case, didn't do anything. He didn't need the Russians to win because he didn't think he was going to win. No one did. Not Hillary Clinton until the last couple of days of her stupid campaign, her poorly, poorly run campaign, when she spent mostly sick and making mistake after mistake after mistake. Not anyone in the media who constantly laughed at the very idea of a Trump presidency. I mean, does anybody not remember 2016? When every major media outlet laughed at the idea that Trump would even be the nominee, much less the president of the United States? I laughed along with it too. I made jokes about it too. Because no one believed he could be president. No one believed that any people sane enough would vote for him. But people did. Half the country voted for him. Or more. Depending on how you count it. Democrats have laid themselves bare as the greedy power mongers that they are. So badly that they've actually made some of the Republicans look good. I never thought Mitch McConnell, Lindsey Graham, or anybody like that could ever recoup their reputation after the Bush years. These were guys who were just unbelievably partisan throughout Bush's presidency, throughout Obama's presidency. Warmongering dickheads who have never done a good thing ever in Congress. And yet, they're being rehabilitated because they can defend Trump on this issue. If you are a liar, and you know you're a liar, and you lie about everything, but you don't break the law, and then someone accuses you of breaking the law, it makes total sense for you to make that as public as possible because you know you didn't do anything illegal and it's just a matter of time before you're cleared. This is a simple, strategic 
and tactical move on Trump's part. He's done it, now he's cleared, and now any real criticism of him will always be put alongside of this fake criticism. He is a lock for the second term. And there will be very little Democrats can do to stop him on anything. Because every time they go to the press or they go to the public and say, Donald Trump is breaking the law, even Democratic supporters have got to go, are you sure he's breaking the law this time? Do you have the proof this time? Because you told us you had the proof. Every major media outlet, with the exception of Fox, although Fox to a small degree, was so far out on their skis, as the term goes, they're screwed. I mean, who is going to watch Mitch, Rachel Maddow now? Why would you watch her show after this? Even if you believe Trump is a agent of the Kremlin, uh, you got to wonder, how could Rachel get this Mueller report so wrong? How could she get, how could the analysis be this wrong? There's only one conclusion as the months grind on. And the conclusion is, Trump didn't do this. Trump may be guilty of some things, but he wasn't guilty of this. So you cannot spend all these years grinding down the president and then turn around and go, well, now we're mad about obstruction. There has to be a crime to obstruct. Without the crime, what was Trump obstructing? I was just watching uh, Glenn Greenwald on Democracy Now! And it's the same thing. Now, Glenn Greenwald is a liberal. He worked for Slate. Longtime liberal. He is no fan of Donald Trump. And yet, he has called out the media time and time again because they refused to back down off this story. They even had the gall on CNN to talk about how their report, how their reporting is vindicated. Tim Poole talks about this in his videos. How do you vindicate yourself when you were wrong? You guys were wrong. Even if you concede that, well, Mueller's a Russian too, you were still wrong about the indictments. You're still wrong about impeachment. Not going to happen. And understand what impeachment is. Impeachment is a political process, okay? It doesn't happen unless one party can weather the political storm of impeaching a president. They did it to Nixon because everybody hated Nixon and he was guilty and they caught him. They hated Nixon. Nixon, he went after everybody. And, you know, whatever good Nixon did, uh, he, he didn't do a lot of it. He was a big budget Republican. So, back then, you had the media aligned against the president, but not in a partisan way. This was before, <laughs> before everybody in the media just turned into a bullhorn for the Democrats. So they had credibility. And the president, Nixon, went down and resigned because he would have been impeached. You cannot repeat that in this environment. The, the media has lost credibility. I was just arguing with a guy online. Now, listen to these numbers. The New York Times was celebrating how it had 4 million digital dis, uh, subscribers now. This was a few months ago, I think they announced. The New York Times is celebrating 4 million subscribers online. 
Okay, that includes people in the world. There are 350 million people or more in the United States. So, 4 million subscribers, that's about 1% of the population digitally subscribed to the New York Times. PewDiePie is headed for 100 million subscribers. And he's going to get there. He's over, I think he's over 90 million now. When he does, he does little newscasts on his show and he does Pew News. That Pew News gets more people and more views than any other news organization on YouTube. CNN, MSNBC, Fox News. Can't compare. He's got way more influence. The New York Times is celebrating 4 million digital subscribers like that's something. It's not. Uh, it's, it's an old model. You have to pay after a while to read the New York Times. And uh, the New York Times has, you know, had issues with some of their reporting. Some of their reporting, which they may or may not correct. They've had issues with reporters in the past, plagiarizing. They had Judy Miller, who was a problem. If you remember the whole Judy Miller thing during the run-up to the Bush War, look it up, Google it. I don't have time to explain it. I want to make the video short now. So. New York Times has a lot to answer for, and the internet will come after you. As we've seen time and time again, the internet will find out when you're lying. They always do. Someone on the internet has the time, and they'll dig, and they'll get you. So the New York Times having four million digital subscribers, so what? It's no big deal. It's not influential. That's 1% of the population, maybe, in the United States. Maybe. Assuming the worldwide part doesn't encompass more than, you know, a million or two. Might be less than that. Might be like a half a percent. Maybe two million of those subscribers are overseas because they're just trying to find out what's going on in America. I wouldn't pick the New York Times, by the way. I wouldn't pick the Washington Post. I wouldn't pick any newspaper, really. Newspapers are, they're dying. They're dead. They're basically dead. Electronic news is thriving to some degree, but there's a lot of problems with it. If you want to hear about some of the terrible things that happen, go to Tim Pool's channel. He'll tell you. He worked in that realm. He shows how they game the system, how they'll put an outrageous headline up just to get the clicks to you know, satisfy their sponsors because their sponsors demand a million clicks, put out an outrageous headline, maybe it's not totally true. Then after you get your clicks, you put in a little retraction. Oh, sorry, that wasn't as uh, sensor sensational as we thought. So you can't trust these guys. And let's be honest, the Trump-Russia Trump narrative was a ratings bonanza for everybody. But you can only go to that well so often. Look, the National Enquirer used to do that kind of stuff all the time. The World Daily, what the heck is that called? The World Daily Report or one of those, one of those crazy newspapers that reports on Bat Boy and Bigfoot marrying somebody. Those kinds of, that kind of reporting works for a while and then it just wears off. People go, eh, you don't have any credibility. That's where CNN, MSNBC are headed. Washington Post, New York Times, they're practically there in my view. I mean, this is all my opinion. I don't, you know, you gotta think about millennials and beyond what they're watching. They don't, they don't read newspapers, okay? My nephew, who's uh, 18, he doesn't read newspapers. He doesn't watch TV news. He gets everything off of his phone. My uh, slightly younger nephew, same thing, okay? These are the new, and these people are going to be setting the pace for the future, okay? If you're not on a phone, you don't exist for these people. You just don't exist. You don't have a website, <laughs> 
used to be people had newsletters. That's how people on the fringe <laughs> would communicate. And if you didn't have a copy of the newsletter or find it somewhere in some store or some newsstand, you know, you maybe saw it in the back of another magazine and then you could order it, but you'd have to pay for it. Now it's they're everywhere. You go on the internet, eventually you'll find it. Find it on YouTube, you'll find it on wherever, social media. It's everywhere. Everybody has an opinion, everybody has their own TV show. So this Trump Russia narrative is nonsense because you've got literally thousands of YouTubers saying it's nonsense. Yeah, you've got a few defending the status quo. Those guys, oh, keep watching their channel. You just keep watching their channel if you want. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stick to people who know who the enemy is. The enemy is authority. It always has been. Unless you're in the power seat, your enemy is the people in power. They are the enemy. That doesn't mean you have to like pick up arms and go after them. No, no, no. I'm not suggesting anything violent. But understand that they're in power. They want to stay in power. And they want to control things and have more power and more money. Trump is no exception to that rule. But you cannot have a serious discussion if you're going to just throw your lot in with one side of the authority figures because that just makes you a stooge for them. It's like medieval times. You're just following one of the nobles. You don't believe in freedom or liberty or destroying the monarchy. You're a monarchist. You just want your guy to be king. Don't be a monarchist. Be a free thinker. Think for yourself. Don't listen to anybody. Don't trust anybody. I mean, you could hear things, but you have to look at it with skepticism. And this Trump-Russia narrative, uh, it's very, very sketchy. The whole thing was sketchy from the beginning. And I think if you believe it, uh, I think it's just, you have to really look inside yourself and say to, say to yourself, is this just wishful thinking on my part? You know, back in the day, I really couldn't stand Bush. And I would read articles about Bush uh, that he maybe went back to being an alcoholic, that perhaps he was mentally ill, that perhaps he was a religious weirdo, might kill us all, you know. And part of me wanted some of those crazy conspiracy theories to be true so I could say, aha, see everybody, I was right about Bush. He's a monster. Join me. Join me in fighting the Bushes. But the basic truth is he was just another greed head who had power in Washington and used it for himself and his rich buddies so Trump is no different but uh, you know you cannot you cannot upend the the bad part of Trump by just doing something other by by doing something else that's bad and railroading him you're just opening the door. Now, if you're, maybe somebody out there is a Bernie supporter. I was not, I wouldn't be a socialist. No way, not, not ever. But uh, I understand your, your, your uh, compulsion to uh, uh, like Bernie. I, I, I don't think he's a terrible person. Um, you know, he seems less warlike and seems more populist, which is nice. I think that's a positive about him. But, you know, the thing is, he threw his lot in with Hillary Clinton. He supported her. She is not populist at all. Uh, you know, it would have been the same thing for me. I supported Ron Paul during his run. If Ron Paul had supported Mitt Romney, I would have lost all respect for him. Uh, he didn't. He didn't get to be president or he didn't get anything, but I still respect him. He's still very credible to me. I could watch his podcast and go, there's a credible guy. He didn't sell out his principles. Bernie, 
he made that mistake. So you know what kind of guy he is. He's a guy who's going to go, okay, I guess I'll play ball here. So if he'll play ball there, why won't he play ball when it comes time to sell you down the river? Why wouldn't he? Why wouldn't he send jobs overseas just like the other Democrats to, I don't know, get free college or whatever his program du jour is? Why wouldn't he do it? Why wouldn't he trade one for the other? Why not? He made a deal before. Don't follow Bernie. I, I, not because he's a socialist, but because he supported Hillary Clinton. And Hillary Clinton clearly is just a terrible, terrible candidate. My God, how much more evidence do you need to stack up? H.A. Goodman says Hillary's going to run again. I'm starting to believe it. I really am. I mean, the Democrats have nothing. Biden hasn't even announced he's running. I think he's going to announce on Wednesday. But uh, I don't know. Him against Bernie? And all the other guys, it's going to be a bloodbath. I, I got to say, I'm looking forward to the Democratic uh, debate, at least. Uh, that should be interesting. It's going to be a battle of identity politics. Who could do the worst identity politics, I guess. I mean, and, and look, identity politics is all that's left now. Identity politics was not what the Democratic Party was about. When I was in it, it was about helping marginalized groups not dividing them. <laughs> we wanted those marginalized groups to be just like us, to have the same opportunities, not to be treated differently. And that's what we're left with. We're, we're left with this ridiculous identity politics. It's very divisive. It's very divisive and a lot, it turns a lot of people off. My final thought here, I uh, follow Sargon of Akkad. I don't know if you watch him, but he uh, just recently announced he's running for um, EU parliament, parliament uh, because the UK is in the EU. They have representatives that go to the EU. So he's running. And uh, so is Count Dankula, if you follow him, by the way. Uh, and it's, it's really shaken up the political landscape in the UK. And I think a lot of what happens in the UK eventually starts to happen in the United States because I see, you know, I see the UK as this sort of, it was a dying empire and it was uh, the old guard and the United States is kind of like that. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're a little, we're different in some ways, of course, but we're a little further ahead. And then, you know, we eventually head to where the UK is in a lot of ways because a lot of people here, you know, they love the Europeans and they love people from the UK and the whole, you know, English milieu. So uh, a lot of people here would like to emulate that. And it's, it's being tried. There's a lot of political correctness. But what we've seen in the UK is, uh, well, Sargon seems to think it's the end of political correctness. And God, I hope so. God, I hope the trend ends there. So it will end here. Um, but uh, it, we may be in for the same thing that happened over there, which is political correctness gets so bad, a guy like Sargon is now going to run for office. YouTubers now run for office. We have plenty of YouTubers here that could run for office that have uh, the following. <laughs> so if you can imagine like someone like Sticks and Hammer or the Ra Razor Fist, the Rageaholic running for office, you know, that could be a very interesting thing. Uh, if if uh, PC culture gets this bad, and it's gotten pretty bad here. I don't know if it'll get as bad, but I don't know. Uh, in some places, some places in the United States, being PC has gotten way out of hand. I, I was shocked to see how bad it is in Philadelphia uh, with, uh, with a few events there and Antifa coming out of the woodwork. But, uh, man... Uh, I just, look, if you're a Democrat or a liberal, or you're on the left side of politics, it's time to clean house. It really is. And you're not doing yourself any favor by supporting anyone in the Democratic Party you don't uh, feel is a good candidate. And I know 
a lot of you out there sacrificed your principles to hold your nose and vote for Hillary Clinton. But voting for the lesser of two evils is still evil. I encourage you to stick to your principles. I encourage you to look at the Green Party. Look, Jill Stein, not my candidate, but you know, she did some cool stuff. I, I, I had some respect for her. You know, again, even though I don't agree with all their stances, you know, she was willing to uh, uh, run and protest the, the debates and her lack of inclusion. You know, do yourself a favor. Think about voting for Democrats that, or, or left, left leaning people who are outside the Democratic Party. Send a message to the Democrats so you can pull them towards the issues that really matter most. Because right now, they just seem to be consumed by identity politics and nonsense. So unless, until they're told, listen, we're done with this, you gotta give us something real here. You gotta, you gotta bring the troops home. You, you gotta uh, just acknowledge that Trump has created some jobs and, and say, yes, that's a good thing. Let's create more. Let's create more. And here's how we could do it and work with the president. For God's sake, you got a guy who's actually creating jobs, help him out. Here's what you should do. Cut spending, okay? Cut the military spending. That's what we need to do. Trump is spending too much. He's a rich guy, that's how he solves his problems. Cut the damn spending. I'm gonna leave it at that. Whew, that was a rant. Okay, that's it for Tony D's media podcast. I hope I don't have to do another one on the Mueller report, but we'll see you next time.